Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about motivation and preparation for mission. But before we get started, Elisa, will you pray for us? Absolutely. Dear Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, that we have this opportunity to come before you today to open up your word and read about and learn about this most important topic of mission. Lord, this is where you get all of us in, engaged in sharing the gospel about you. There are precious truths here. Please send your Holy Spirit, Lord, as we study this. Help us to he be good hearers of what you say and, and open our hearts to also uh, be the doers of your word. And uh, we thank you, Lord, that we, we, we can come together freely and, and study today. And we thank you that you're always with us and, and you hear our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So our memory verse uh, this week is Luke 24, 44. <clears throat> These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. <clears throat> and we're going to talk more about that in Thursday's lesson. But I want to ask you, think about it a little bit, what motivates you? Because motivation is the desire or reason a person has for doing something for someone or acting in a particular way. Preparation involves an action to get ready so that things can be accomplished. Motivation has to do with something that causes or propels us to act. Preparation makes it possible for the plans to happen. Well, Jesus and what he has done for us provides our motivation for mission. He also has entrusted us with his spirit, thus enabling to accomplish his will and his mission mandate. So not only is our love for Christ part of our motiva motivating factor for mission, but he also sends us the Holy Spirit to help motivate us as well. And we know in John, 1 John 4.19, it says, We love because he first loved us. This denotes cause and effect. The reason that motivates us to respond or to act as we respond to God's love, we do so proclaiming the living and living out in words and deeds the good news that Jesus is our Savior and Lord. Our sharing of the truth as contained in his word will fall upon receptive ears, and will yield much fruit as the Spirit works, thus causing, the same, at the same time, we must be prepared for the rejection of the word by many, which can cause us to lose hope. So we don't want to lose our motivation and our hope because God tells us what to expect. Mm -hmm. And he he talked to his disciples a lot about that, and we'll be getting into that uh, a whole lot more in this lesson. Philippians 1.15 through 18 says, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and strife and also from goodwill. So what he's saying here is there's a lot of different reasons uh, and motivations for <clears throat> sharing Christ. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my chains, but rather later out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. So in verse 18 says, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice. Yes, will rejoice. So these are powerful words. Mm -hmm. Whether in present truth pre preached is Christ, and that is, and that is what mattered to Paul. Ideally, though, our motives for preaching Christ, for mission, for reaching others, is the good news. Should be out of love, out of truth, and not out of selfish ambition or out of envy or strife. 
So the story of redemption motivates us to both prepare and engage God's mission in God's story. As a missionary, God our Father cares and wants to bless others through us. Therefore, he has commanded us to go to all people, languages, tribes, and nations. So let's look at a few reasons for missions. And this can be found, um, actually these reasons come from uh, a book called Passport to Missions uh, by the Institute of World Mission. And so we're going to go through a little summary of, of what that, that is. Firstly, Jesus is the, is the unique source of life and salvation, and people need to know about him. He said that there's no other way to heaven but through the Son. And so John uh, 3.36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not have life. We want people to have eternal life. We, that that is, is a very uh, motivating factor in mission. Hence, there's not salvation in any other name. He also says in 1 John 5, 12, he who has the Son has life. He does not have the Son, does not have life. So Christ is the unique um, source for our salvation. Uh, secondly, Jesus is the divine Son of God. So he doesn't just claim to be a teacher, which he was. When he was here on earth, he taught, he, he healed, and he discipled, discipled, his, dis, discipled those around him. So there's others, great leaders, that we see in the Bible, like Moses and David, um, or other religions have some other god that they look at, but no other religion uh, claims divinity as its founder. Jesus claims full divinity. That is equality with God. <clears throat> so the disciples who also proclaimed his divinity fearlessly, we see that from every single one of the disciples of Christ. In fact, so much so they were willing to die. And most of them did. Mm -hmm. Nearly all of them died horrible deaths. If you read, they were crucified, slayed, uh, dragged. Um, and even John, who died a natural death in old age, was boiled in oil. So they were willing to give up everything. What motivation, huh? <laughs> to give up everything. <clears throat> and so God raised Jesus... We see that he raised him from the dead. So this has to be true. And <clears throat> uh, we see that, that that offers unique salvation because um, we see in Ephesians 8, 9, so um, by grace are you saved through faith. No other world religion offers salvation. Um, it's, it's only through Christ. And Jesus offers universal salvation, all inclusive and exclusive. And we see in John 3.16, which is a scripture most of us have, have memorized, is that God so loved the world that he believes in, in that <clears throat> and that he who believes in him will not perish and have everlasting life. So the good news that God offers a free salvation based on this unique Jesus. The great commission Jesus makes it clear we can have part in sharing the good news with others. Mm -hmm. So I want to share something from Prophets and Kings to wrap up before we get into the rest of our lesson. Willing service and joyous self-denial is the only spirit that should actuate the followers of Jesus. Our divine master is given an example of how his disciples are to work. To those whom he bade, follow me, I will make you fishers of men. He offered no stated sum as a reward for their services, so they weren't given money. They were to share with him in self-denial and self-sacrifice. Not for wages we receive are we to labor, 
but the motive that prompts us to work for God should have in it nothing akin to self-serving. Unselfish devotion and a spirit of sacrifice have always been and always will be the first requisite of acceptable service. Our Lord and Master designs that one thread of selfishness shall be woven in, not one thread of selfishness should be woven into his work. So we don't do it for us, we do it for God. <clears throat> in our efforts, we are to bring the tact and skill and ex exitude of, and wisdom that God of the perfection required of the builders of the earthly tabernacle. Yet in all our labors, we are to remember that the greatest talents or the most splendid service are only acceptable when self is laid on the altar, a living, consuming sacrifice. So let's take a look at the events um, that the early church, and we're going to look at a lot of scriptures today. Mm -hmm. So Lisa. Yeah. Would you like to okay, share with us? Yeah. Um, I, before I get in, though, reflecting on that last statement from Ellen White, it, it, it brings to mind the, the text in John 3.30 where John the Baptist said, I must decrease so he can increase. Mm -hmm. And while that was true of his prophetic mission, it's true of every one of us. Yes. We have to decrease so he can increase, and that really is true mission. And so I, I really love that, that quote from Ellen White because it really sums it up beautifully. All right, so on Sunday, we're talking about to share the good news. And this is, this is really the story of what happened um, right after Christ had been crucified and how it was revealed to the women and the disciples that he was not in the tomb. And so it's a very interesting story that we can learn much from, and it has application for mission even today. So as the story goes, early Sunday morning following Jesus' crucifixion and death, a group of women went to the tomb with the intent to prepare Christ's body for burial. But instead of finding his body, to their great surprise, they discovered an empty tomb. Jesus had foretold his resurrection, but the reality and truth of what he had said had not sunk in for the women or for the disciples. So the scene that unraveled following this discovery tells us that there was a variety of responses from his followers. So as we study this scene, we can learn about the type of responses we may encounter as we go forth in mission and share the good news of Christ. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. And it says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. So this is speaking about the women um, who had come with him from Galilee. And then in verse 2, it goes on, But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood beside them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living amongst the dead? He is not here, for he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen clothes lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. So let's discuss the different characters in this scene and how they responded. First, we have the women. 
These were believers going about their duty of service to their Lord, not fully understanding the truth of his resurrection, but they were performing their duty to the best of their understanding. In other words, they were living up to the light that they understood. Their faithfulness was rewarded. They were visited by heavenly angels who helped them to understand the meaning of Christ's words, revealing to them the truth of Christ's resurrection. Overjoyed in this new understanding, they quickly went and told others the good news. Next, we see the disciples' response. They were overcome with disbelief and grief, and they considered the testimony of the women to be idle tales. Despite all the evidence that Christ had given them during his ministry, these individuals were spiritually blinded and not even motivated to go and see for themselves. The testimony sounded too fanatical to them. And then we learn of Peter, who did not fully believe or understand the women's testimony. Yet because of his love for the Lord and the hope that maybe these women were speaking truth, he ran to the tomb to see for himself. So we learn a few insights here about mission. First of all, those actively seeking the Lord will be rewarded with even greater light inspiring them to eagerly share the good news that they have learned. And then another group, our many may be slow to believe our testimony on face value. They need to experience and see for themselves, yet they are reluctant to change course and find out for themselves. They lack that motivation that Barb talked about. And then there are some who will be inspired by our testimony, perhaps not completely understanding, but there's hope there and they are motivated and will take action to learn more. So in summary again, we are not to lose hope that at first our efforts may seem to produce little fruit. The Lord just commands us, go and tell. As we continue to unfold this story, we will find that this first interaction may not have returned the results that the women had hoped for, but the Lord was not yet done, revealing himself to his slow-to-believe disciples. So, Barb, can you tell us what happened next and the importance of the prophetic foundation in the mission work? Yes. As Elisa has said, <clears throat> first, the good news is Christ rose. Mm -hmm. And then we see how Christ dealt with his disciples next. So <clears throat> in the prophetic foundation, um, after the res resurrection, he began appearing to his followers. Looking, and, and what we're going to look at is really his third appearance. It's like first he appeared to Mary and and the women at, at the tomb. The road to Emmaus he was, was the second uh, we see in, in Luke. And the third is where he came amongst the disciples. And we're going to jump in at Luke 24, and we're going to read verses 36 through 39. <clears throat> now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and said to them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and frightened, and supposed they had seen a spirit. And when he said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold, both my hands and my feet, that I myself, that it is I myself, handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe, for joy and marvel, ha had marveled and said to them, have you any food here? So it's interesting what we see here 
that first the disciples didn't believe out of fear. They, couldn't, they really couldn't believe what they were seeing. Then after seeing Jesus and realizing it was him and being assured that he was indeed alive, <clears throat> they did not believe for joy. So I, I, I thought about what that meant quite a bit. But the lesson has uh, one idea that we can look at. Have you ever seen something or had something happen to you that felt too good to be true? That's how they felt. They go, this can't be real. This is too good to be real. Our Savior, who we watch suffer and die on the cross, is among us now. And so Christ wanted them, took them one more step, not only touching, but to see that he could eat as well. So uh, we pick up in verse 42 here. So they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and some honeycomb. And he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and psalms concerning me. Now it's interesting that he, he uses these, um, these three pieces because when you look at the law of Moses. The law of Moses is really those books that Moses read. So it's not just about the Ten Commandments here. It's about all of the, of the books that Moses wrote. Then he said the prophets. And so we see all the different prophets in, in the Bible. And I, I think of Daniel in Daniel 9, where Daniel... Um, actually put in a timeline, the 70-week prophecy that told of Christ, and in the Psalms, because King David had written the Psalms, and all of them were about God and praising God. So if Jesus had left them only with experience, when he departed, their faith may have not lasted over time, the experience could have faded. They would forget or start perhaps even to question it. So Jesus didn't stop showing by showing them his scars and eating fish in front of them. Instead, he took them back to the word and showed them prophetic foundation of his work in ministry. And I'm sure that every time that they reread those words, they remembered that they were with Christ. So no matter how great the experience they had with him, Jesus wanted their faith to be grounded in the word of God. And that is so important for us, that our faith be grounded too in the word of God. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. <clears throat> it says in verse 45. 46, then he said unto them, thus it is written, and that is as it is necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be, re re be preached to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So not only did he show them that he was risen and took them to the word to tell about himself, but he also wanted them to see this important concept of repentance and remission of sin, which is another piece of, of um, coming to salvation. You, and you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city in Jerusalem until you have endured with power, until you are endured, endued with power from on high. So not only did he go through these steps with them uh, when he met with them, he also said, okay, wait a little bit longer because I'm going to give you power from on high. So these words um, that he spoke, um, which were written by Moses and the prophets, were so important 
because it really proved all of these things led to Christ. Here, too, we find a powerful motivation for witness, for mission. The word of God, Jesus knew to solidify the disciples' experience. They needed to understand why he had to die and the resurrection um, signified. They needed their worldview to be shifted from a political and earthly kingdom, which many of them thought, to the great solution and the victory of Christ over death. The gospel was so much more than achieving political sovereignty in Israel. And it's that today, too. We see a lot of, of, of things happening politically. But really, the true sovereignty comes from Christ. So I want to finish um, this, this section by reading to you from early writings, which is actually one of my favorite of, of her books. Jesus remained with his disciples 40 days, causing them joy and gladness of heart as he opened to them more fully the realities of the kingdom of God. He commissioned them to bear testimony to the things which they had seen and heard concerning his sufferings, death, and resurrection, that he had made a sacrifice for sin, and that all who might come to him unto him and find life. With faithful tenderness, he told them that they would be persecuted and distressed. See here, he didn't promise that mission would be easy. But they would find relief in recalling their experience and remembering the words that he had spoken to them. He told them that he had overcome the temptations of Satan and obtained victory through trials and suffering. Satan would have no more power over him but would bring his temptation to bear more directly upon them. So when Satan couldn't get to them, to, to Christ, he came to his disciples. And upon all who should believe in his name, but they could overcome as he overcame. What a beautiful promise that we can overcome as Christ overcame. Jesus endowed his disciples with power to work miracles and told them that although they should be persecuted by wicked men, he would from time to time send angels to deliver them. Their lives could not be taken until their mission should be accomplished. Then they might be required to seal with their blood the testimonies which they had borne. Our experience with Jesus cannot be sustained without that foundation of his word, including the prophecies that point to the history and events leading up to and including the first advent of Christ. So, Elisa, you're going to talk to us about waiting mm -hmm. and mission. Waiting. Okay, yes. So this is a very interesting concept that sometimes <clears throat> what's most needed in mission or preparing for mission is to wait. It sounds so unproductive to many of us, Yet that is just what Jesus commanded his disciples to do just before he ascended to heaven. So waiting is actually an action. Oxford Dictionary definition for waiting it's, is the action of staying where one is or delaying action until a particular time or until something else happens. And this is exactly what the Lord commanded the disciples to do. In Acts 1-4, we read that the Lord commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. In other words, the disciples were not yet ready to go on mission, the mission he was sending them on. They were not yet fully equipped. What was missing? An outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the power from on high, Christ knew that this special dispensation of the Father's Spirit was vital to the success of their mission, to be a witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the world beyond. However, this waiting period was not to be spent idly, like perhaps in the few minutes we may spend while we're waiting for a bus. Instead, it was to be a time of preparation. Well, let's read about the, what the disciples and those with them were doing during this preparation period. And what can we learn that is so vital to our own preparation for mission today? 
So we pick up the story then again in Acts 1, 12 to 26. And verses 12 and 13 tell us that the disciples returned to Jerusalem from Mount Olivet after the Lord's ascension, and then they went to the upper room where they were staying. And verse 14 says, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary and the mother of Jesus and his brothers. So they continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. We find them earnestly praying and pleading for the blessing of the promised by Christ. Luke does not provide the details of what they were praying about, but certainly they were praying for wisdom and courage and strength to fulfill the mission together. So how important that is, a lesson for us, to properly prepare for mission. And then the story goes on in verse 15. It says, In those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether the number of names was about 120. And said, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong he burst open into the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem so that the field is called in their own language a kaldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his dwelling place be desolate, and let no one live in it, and let another take his office. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism, of, the, of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed two. Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. So as Barb was mentioning that um, Jesus had spent 40 days with them before his ascension, explaining and, and showing in the scriptures all the things about himself, they had come to this deeper understanding of, of the, the scriptures and understood that with the, with, with the um, falling away of Judas, another one had to be replaced because the Psalms had said, let another one take his office. So this is the work that they were doing. Um, in earnest prayer, they were seeking the Lord and, and asking him, who should take this place? Who is the right person? So the awful office of apostleship was being restored to 12 men as it had been determined by Christ. So the Bible is clear that this weighty time was not idle, but it was filled with purpose, organization, and mission-driven action. And for us living in the last days, Hebrews 10, 24 to 25, gives us some wise counsel that we that while we wait for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that has been promised to help us complete the final mission work, um, there are things that we should be doing to prepare. And it says, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So as a body of Christ, we are to be encouraging and inspiring good works and love toward one another, uniting Christ's righteousness and his mission to go and proclaim the gospel to a lost world and make disciples and baptize them and teach them to observe all things that he commanded.
And I'll close this day with a quote from Ellen White from uh, Gospel Workers, and it says, the work of the Christian laborer is not light or unimportant. He has a high vocation from which his whole future life must take its mold and its coloring. He who gives himself to so sacred a work should bend all his energies to accomplish it. He should aim high. He will never reach a higher standard than that which he aims to attain. He cannot diffuse light until he has first received it. He must be a learner before he can have sufficient experience and wisdom to become a teacher, able to open the scriptures to those who are in darkness. If God has called men to be laborers together with him, it is equally certain that he has called them to make the best possible preparation to rightly represent the sacred elevating truths of his word. So our story continues to unfold with the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on the apostles and those gathered with them in the upper room. So Barb, can you tell us more about what happened at Pentecost and the furtherance of God's kingdom that uh, was a result? We could spend more than an hour <laughs> <laughs> just in this chapter. Yeah. But uh, we're going to kind of uh, run through and hit some highlights uh, of this outpouring, this, this Pentecost uh, experience that the disciples had. And so let's jump in to Acts 1, <clears throat> Acts 2, 1 through 41. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all of one accord in one place. So they were here in the upper room, and they were all in one accord. And they were one accord in Christ. If you read the other scriptures, the things that they're in, in Acts 1, they talk about that they were praying, they were talking about Christ, they were remembering their time together with him. And so it was a, a very special time. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues of fire that sat on each of them. Ellen White says about this experience, and that I may know him, page 344. On the day of Pentecost, the Infinite One revealed himself in power to the church. By his Holy Spirit, he descended from the heights of heaven as a rushing mighty wind into the room in which the disciples were assembled. Words of penitent and confession and sin were mingled with songs of praise for sins forgiven. Words of thanksgiving and prophecy were heard. All of heaven was bending low to behold and adore the wisdom and matchless incomprehensible love. The apostles and disciples were lost in wonder and explained herein his love. They grasped the imparted gift. The heart were surcharged with a benevolence so full, so deep, so far-reaching that it impelled them to go to the ends of the earth testifying. God forbid that we should glory save in the cross or our Lord Jesus Christ. They were filled with an intense longing to add to the church should those who should be saved. What an amazing experience. And we too need that Holy Spirit filling to move forward to do God's work. When they were weak, they, when, when they felt they were weak, the Spirit made them strong. Often they prayed for boldness. And so we see just the amazing work that the Holy Spirit did in their lives. So let's go on to verse 4. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred and the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in their own language, then they were amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, not all of these who speak are Galileans. And how is it that we hear each in our own language, which is, 
which we were born. There were Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, uh, Phrygia and Pamphyra, Philia, Egypt and parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we heard them speak in their own tongues the wonderful words of God. So they were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? And I think we need to look at this speaking in tongues in this situation because the Spirit is the one who gave them this ability. So this is a spiritual gift, the speaking in tongues. And what's crucial here is that God empowered each person for the benefit of the believers. This wasn't for their own benefit, the speaking in tongues. But this benefit were for those who did not know Christ or for those who did know Christ but did not understand this important message that was being given about Christ. The blessing wasn't meant at all for their own good. I want to repeat that because that's so important. It's a blessing fit for heaven, a blessing making it easier to do business in a foreign language. The blessing was given fulfilling God's mission to the lost. Today, God calls on each of his followers to use their personal gifts for the good of his mission to unbelievers. And we all have spiritual gifts. And when we use them, God blesses and we receive that, the joy that comes only from using his gifts in the world. So I'm going to jump now to verse 13. Others mocking said, they're full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. These are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And we see these words of Joel, which are actually words that applied then, and they apply in our day to day. And in verse 17, it says, And it shall come to pass in the days, says God, that I will pour out my flesh upon all, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servant and on my maid servant, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. And the sun shall turn, be turned into darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Verse 23, him being delivered by determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands have crucified and put to death whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it is not possible that ye should be held by it. So we see here <clears throat> that Peter was bold enough basically to say, you kill Christ. Many of you here kill Christ. But many were convicted by his sermon. And so we see that, that um, we're going to jump down to verse 38 here. And, and they said, what should we do? Then Peter said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gold, gift of the Holy Spirit and the promise to you and your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted him, them being saved through the perverse generation. 
Then those who gladly received the word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. What amazes me about this portion of scripture is that Peter said, some of you here are the reasons Christ was crucified. You were the ones that called out and said, crucify him. Yet Christ is giving them another chance to be saved. And to me, this just shows how gracious and what a loving God that we have, that he will go to every length and every means to help people be saved. And so um, that is a, a God of love that is worth sharing with the world. So it encourages us, and it also encourages us us to witness. So, Elisa, mm -hmm. you're going to give us another picture of the early church. A picture of the early church, yes. You know, I, I think it's important from what you were just reading too, is that, that, that another chance to be saved was actually in the moment, right? He called them to repent and, and be baptized in Christ in the moment. And there's a lot of theology out there today that says you can have a second chance yeah. far down the road, and, and that is not biblical. And, and so it's important for us to understand that. Um, so the picture of the early church. Let's read Acts 2, 41 to 47, and uh, this is very inspiring. It says, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and the, that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. They sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all, as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple... And breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So we find the church here, this early church, they were baptizing, they were being discipled in doctrine, they were fellowshipping over meals and in prayers. And there was a manifestation of God's power in miracles as well. And the sharing of possessions to meet the needs of all of them and the mission that they were undertaking. They had a unity and joy, praising God in daily worship, leading to having favor in the community at large. So the lesson points out that as new members were added, they were carefully discipled in the truth confronting false doctrines and incorrect beliefs to bring them into the full understanding of the gospel. In addition, the application of truth to one's life was instructed through relationships and fellowship as part of the greater group. By participating in the daily life of other believers, under the supervision and the leadership of the spiritually mature and grounded apostles, the new believers were carefully and intentionally discipled into the new life in Christ. So what a beautiful testimony of how the Holy Spirit changes hearts, minds, and motivations. No longer self-serving, this early church was a spirit-led community with a heart for mission, saving of souls, and love for one another. Paul would later give the same counsel to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1, and that says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So when others can see us and the reality of our experience with Christ, it will impact them as well. And perhaps a final thought on this um, from Ellen White. And she writes, If you have accepted Christ as a personal savior, you are to forget yourself and try to help others. So Barb, as we kind of wrap up uh, this, this, this uh, 
lesson for this week. What does it mean to live in the service for others? Well, living in service for others is an interesting concept, and it comes with many joys and many struggles. Mm -hmm. Because we, when, with people, people don't always understand what they need. They don't always understand what's best for them. And those of us who've had children, well, I haven't had children, but I've been around a lot of children, but those of you who have children realize that sometimes they want to do things that aren't best for them. But, but at other times, um, they do. And so the goal in serving people is to guide and, where possible, lead. You can't push it because no one wants to be told what to do. Mm -hmm. So this, this, this mission for people is a challenge and the key to really the mission is the Holy Spirit. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and to, you know, as the Bible says, <laughs> to have that spirit of love for one another um, and encouragement. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and as, as we've walked through this lesson tonight, we see that to have that love, we need to understand Christ, mm -hmm. his mission, his resurrection. We need to understand prophecy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how he fulfills that prophecy. He fulfilled prophecy for the early church when he came the first time. We are seeing prophecy being fulfilled mm -hmm. now if we're paying attention. Prophecy is being fulfilled actually quite quickly right now. As, as we see what's going on in the world and we look at, at um, prophecy in Matthew and in Daniel and in, in Revelation, things are coming together and, and Christ will come soon. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's worth every soul that is willing to come to Christ. Yeah, amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... <clears throat> uh, other final thoughts that I have here, um, and I would like to wrap this up with Testimonies to the Church, Volume 6, page 436. And we're seeing this today, I just mentioned this, peculiar and rapid changes will soon take place. And God's people are to be endowed with the Holy Spirit. And we walked through this today, how we are become endowed with the Holy Spirit. So with that, with heavenly wisdom, they meet the emergencies of this age and as far as possible counteract the demoralizing movements of the world. If the church is not asleep, if the followers of Christ are watching and will watch and pray, they may have light to comprehend and appreciate the movements of the enemy. The end is near. God calls upon the church to set in order the things that remain. Workers together with God who are empowered by the Lord to take others with you into the kingdom. You are to be God's living agents, channels of light to the world, and round about you are angels of heaven with their commission from Christ to sustain, strengthen, and hold you in working for the salvation of souls. Mm -hmm. How beautiful is Amen. that? And that should be the mission of each one of our lives and each one of our hearts, that great commission that God gave us. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we pray for the outpouring of your spirit on a daily basis. That spirit that was given to the early church, Lord. That spirit of power that will bring others to know you. Lord, we pray that each one of us will have a life filled with you filled with study of you, filled with an understanding of your word, filled with an understanding of the prophecies that you have given us. And Father, we pray that we will see others as you see them, not as maybe people who can be hurtful or difficult, but people that you love, people that we want bound for heaven, 
and souls to be saved for you, Lord. We pray that as we go through this week, you will put in our paths um, divine appointments for those whose hearts are open to you. We pray that our vision, our celestial vision, will realize that you have sent them into our life and that you are to be shared with them. So, Father, we thank you um, for the mission that you have given us in this church and actually to go to the world to share you. And we pray, Lord, that we do that faithfully. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Have a great Sabbath. <laughs>